Well, good morning. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. If you would please stand with us and let's sing Raise a Hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah In the presence of enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah is a word that we use sometimes that we don't always use in normal everyday life that we use in songs sometimes it just simply means praise God it's so simple praise God praise God for who he is and for what he's done in our life and when I think about the word hallelujah and I think about praise there's some other words that come to my mind adoring him honoring him worshiping him and we have that opportunity this morning. It kind of reminds me of a story in the Bible about Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas were beaten, thrown in prison. And what did they do? They prayed and they sang praises because they worship a God who's worthy of our praise in every moment of our life. Praise Him 
favorite verse. Pardon. to lift up our voices and our hearts to the Lord in praise and adoration uh, for all that he's done. And certainly we could spend hours today just off the top of our head witnessing to all the good things that God has done for us. And uh, boy, we've been really blessed today to recall these things through song. So thank you everyone who had a part in that for leading us to worship the Lord today. Well, if you have your Bible with you, I would encourage you to open it to Colossians chapter 1 with me. Colossians chapter 1. I am so grateful that our family was able to get away for a couple weeks on vacation. We, uh, it's like every vacation, um, you know, there's great things and there's, you know, things you got to work through and setbacks and all that kind of stuff. You know, things happen. And um, it just seems like with our family, we just have like the weirdest things happen on vacation. And this one was no different. Um, you know, just so you know that um, because I'm the pastor, that doesn't give me this special like, you know, immunity to things happening when you're on vacation. I want to give you a couple examples. Because everybody's saying, how was the vacation? And, and I, and I want to be honest. So I say, we had a lot of fun, but there were some setbacks. So here, let's just go through a couple of things. Um, we had a great time. We, we got down there, made pretty good time. Um, the, the first part, we kind of just hung out, did some beach days, things like that. And then uh, we were leaving the beach one day, and uh, there was a, it was a car in front of us going a little slow. And um, it's one of those roads where you can pass them. They have the dotted yellow lines. And I'm like, for the love, you know. And I look over. Nobody's coming. So I'm just like, Arr! well, with the air conditioning going full blast and it's 100 degrees, the air conditioner said, I give up. And it goes, and then just hot air coming out, you know. And so we still had almost two weeks of travel left, so we had to find a place to take it to to get the air fixed. I know that first world problems, I get it, but it's Florida, it's hot, and we had to drive a lot. So I'm like, you know, we got to get this taken care of. So long story short, we got that all taken care of. We were able to get on time to our next adventure, Universal Studios. I had a great time there, very tiring, 24,000 steps a day, awesome time. Um, <laughs> 100 degrees, uh, so much fun. And uh, we did, I mean it, I mean it sounds awful, but it was great. And then the morning we were getting up, we were gonna leave and go on a cruise. And you're all like, man, Pastor, you're living it up. Hold on, okay? So it's like 6.30 in the morning, we're all sound asleep except for one member of our family. And she comes over to me and says, Dad, 
I need to go to the emergency room. That's what you want to hear on vacation at 6.30 in the morning. And so I'm like, are you kidding? And a kidney stone strike, you know. So we have to be on the boat at 11.30 a.m. And it's 6.30 and we have to drive an hour to get there. So I'm like, well, let's find, you know, thank God for Google and smartphones. So, you know, there's, there's an emergency room close. We get there. We tell them. And you know how you don't want to be that guy, but I had to be that guy. I'm like, hey, look, she's in a lot of pain. We know what this is. It's a kidney stone. Trust me, we've done this before. And we've got to be on a boat in an hour at, or at 1130. We need to get out of here as soon as possible. To their credit, man, they fast-tracked us. They got us out of there. We made it. Grace is feeling, I mean, our, my daughter was feeling better. <laughs> and... Um, cruise went, went well. We, we got to have a dolphin encounter. We swam. We uh, did some water slides. We ate great food. All the things that you do there. And then the morning, uh, we left and came back home to our place we were staying there after the cruise. So we get back. Everything's good. Night before we left, we're sitting at a light getting some last minute supplies for the trip home. Get rear-ended. <laughs> So it's like, for real. So uh, I, I get out and I look at the car. The car has no damage. I'm like, praise the Lord. Other person's car didn't look so great. So we exchange information. I ask everybody if they're all right. We're like, yeah, we're fine. We get down the road to where we were going and, and Liv's like, I got a headache. I'm like, yeah, I kind of got one too. It hurt a little bit. And then five minutes later, she's like, it's kind of moving around to the front now. And I'm like, eh, you know, it's, it'll be all right. And I'm already thinking like, no. Five minutes later, we're in the store, and she goes, everything's blurry. I'm like, awesome. So we head to the ER and uh, get her checked out. Thankfully, we can laugh about all this stuff because, you know, the Lord was good to us. We had, Like I said, there were some setbacks. It didn't really interfere with anything we were trying to do. But just so you know, we're not immune to that kind of stuff. It was just like, okay, you know. And uh, she's fine. Um, you know, they almost had to amputate her right arm. Kidding. Um, she's fine. She's um, fine. Just slight concussion. Um, but praise the Lord. I can truly say that from a grateful heart that none of that was a big deal. Uh, we were able to get through it all. We're back home. And uh, so when I tell you I'm glad to be back home and you're like, yeah, all right. No, I really mean it. I'm glad to be back home. <laughs> home soil is good and uh, all that kind of stuff with it. But it, we're good. We're glad to be home with you as well to worship the Lord together. So that's the kind of stuff that goes on on our vacations. Now, I want to thank... Aaron and Stephen for their preaching and teaching while we were gone. Um, I, I'm, I said it when I was ill a couple weeks ago. I'm so thankful that we have capable men here who can take the word of God and feed God's people. And they, they just did another outstanding job. And I thank them both for um, taking that to heart and serving you in that way. And i um, grateful for their love for the Lord and his word and his people. All right. Before we get right into one more thing, after this morning's service, we have to vote for trustees because I failed to do that a couple weeks ago. So uh, I'll, we'll do a real quick business meeting right after the service to vote for some trustees, and that'll be good. So that'll come later on. Now, Colossians. As you can see on the screen, can everybody read what that block is? Raise your hand if you can read what that says. Because okay? there's some people who are like, what's the design, you know? And the first time I ever saw that, I remember I was in school and um, uh, St. Teresa, and, and, and the teacher had that on her desk. And I just walked up to it, and I'm like, what's all the puzzle for? You know, and she had to, like, help me see it. I'm like, oh, it says Jesus. That's so cool. And the reason that I'm using that kind of as our, our uh, symbol for this study is because the book of Colossians uh, has a lot of uh, information in it, has a lot of cultural explanation. Paul is understanding through Epaphras, who's the guy who started the church there. Paul's understanding what the Colossians are living in and their culture and kind of what they're dealing with, trying to add Jesus to their religions. And so what he does in this letter is a masterful job of putting Jesus forward by explaining how Christianity should work in, in life. How Jesus takes first place among everything else around us. So it may not be overt at first and throughout, but it's very clear in this book that Jesus is everything. He is all sufficient and supreme overall. 
And so that's what this book is about. Aaron did a wonderful job getting us acclimated to Colossians last week. He walked us through the first chapter and showed us kind of where Paul was starting and where he was going. Aaron gave us a background on the Colossian culture, which is key to understanding what Paul is saying here. I will argue this morning that the culture the Colossians were living in is similar to the culture that we live in today. Different place in the world, different time in history, but people are people. And the culture, I will argue, is very similar to even what we're living in today. So, Paul begins to write this letter. He introduces himself. He does a, a shorter prayer at the beginning, verses 3 through, uh, three through 8. Talks a little bit about their love. And what we're going to focus on today is verses 9 through 14. Now, this is Paul's, what we would call, second prayer for the Colossians, uh, that Second prayer, the things that he's asking God to do for the Colossians. Now, I would like to remind us what the Colossians were living through at this time. Now, this is not a Jewish community. It is a, a, um, a, a Roman-type city. It was in uh, Macedonia, Asia Minor. It's a Roman-influenced city. So it's not like we're talking about the Jews in Jerusalem here who had this background of Judaism. We're talking about men and women who came to know Christ, who are figuring this thing out on their own in a place called Colossae, which is very Roman-influenced. And what was going on there was uh, the Colossians were saying, okay, we have all these other beliefs and religions in our culture uh, we love Roman culture because it's made life easy. It's advanced us so much. Aaron talked about the Roman roads, Roman peace, and Roman law, how it just kind of made a comfort culture for anybody who bought into it. And so they loved the culture. They loved all the, the different kinds of ways to live and the different things to indulge in. They had some mystical beliefs going on. And then they hear about Jesus and they say this, great, let's add him to all of this other stuff we have going on. And so they're adding Jesus to what's already kind of an undercurrent in their life is religion and belief. And you can see how Paul is going to attack this right off the bat by saying, no, it's all about Jesus. It's not adding him to anything. It's getting rid of all of that other and making it all Jesus. So this is what they're dealing with. Uh, they were trying to make a unique to me religion. In other words, not a denomination that I meet with a bunch of people, but here's what I personally am going to take from, in our day and age, I'll take a little bit from Islam, I'll take a little bit from Hinduism, a little bit from mysticism, I'll sprinkle some Jesus in there, and even pop culture. Even the things that are going on in our culture that I like, I'm just going to mix all that up into what I like from each of those, and that is my God and my religion. This is what we're dealing with in Colossae. So Rome was the beloved culture. It was a comfort culture. Sound familiar? Roman roads were a big deal. You're like, big deal, it's a road. You don't understand Thousands and thousands of miles of roads that all led to Rome, allowing mingling of cultures, allowing people to experience all the, the wealth and the prestige of Rome, and they loved it. We have Roman roads today. It's called the internet, right? It's our way of kind of navigating the world and mixing of cultures and getting our hands on anything we want, learning about anything we want, and experiencing anything we want through this. So you can see in a different way how we are in a very similar situation. We're open to a comfort culture. I mean, think about 50 years ago. If you wanted a hamburger, you would get in your car and you would drive to McDonald's and you would go inside and you would talk to someone and you would hand them physical money and they would give you change back and they would hand you your food. You had the option of driving home or eating it there. Today, you can lay in your bed, pick up your phone, hit a couple buttons, and there's a guy knocking on the door 20 minutes later with your food, which is skip, by the way. If you do that, man, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I want, you know, some dude I don't know bringing my food to me. 
And you're like, well, they tape it. That's fine. But there's ways around that too. You know what I mean? Uh, I just, I'm not. I'm not that lazy, I guess. I'll be lazy in other ways, but not that way, all right? Uh, but man, we a comfort culture, and we love it. We think it, we think it is so good, and we indulge in all the blessings that come from it. But in a way, it actually shapes how we view the Word of God and our Lord Himself. Rome used the cross to demonstrate its authority over people. They would hang people on a cross to show you don't cross Rome. You don't mess with Rome. Jesus used the cross to demonstrate God's love for people. Romans 5 eight. but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, there's a difference here. It should be different. It, it's authority and, and control versus the love of God. So Paul, while in Roman prison, wrote this letter to address these issues. He was giving them an apostolic confirmation of the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. Now, here's a question for us to consider this morning. You ready? Do we allow our culture to distort how we see Jesus and his word? Does that subtle change in per- perception affect how we live and serve? Does our culture affect the way we see Jesus and his word? Can you identify ways that you have allowed cultural opinions to shape your perspectives of Jesus or his church? Now, it's easy for us to think about other churches and other people right now, isn't it? Because maybe we went to a church that's popular and we're like, well, they've allowed the culture to change them. And, and, and that guy over there, he's allowed the culture to take him a little far. And, and it's easy to pick that out in others. It's, it's harder to identify it in ourselves because we like to believe that we're true to it. But does culture actually affect us? See, these Colossians were adding to their faith those things that were comfortable and acceptable to culture. Now, let's pause and consider this thought. The things that we pick up from culture are more subtle than we think. It's less the external trappings like the style of whatever, the venue, the dress, the sound, the look, the feel. It's less about that because, you know, there's a lot of guys who will say today, you know, all these churches are bending to the culture. And I, there probably are churches that are doing that. I don't, I'm not in standing in judgment of any church that does that. I got to worry about my own business, okay? So I'm not preaching against anybody else today. I'm preaching to me. And you happen to be here, all right? So it's so subtle though because we can get the other stuff right. We can look like a church. We can look like we're at church. We can, you know, carry the word of God. We can sing songs that, that uh, minister. Those are all things that are fine and well and good. But the subtle things is what I want us to be aware of today. Because it's the subtle things that will get us. Do we, do you, friend, allow socioeconomic differences determine how you treat people? The, the Word of God talks about, James talks about, if somebody comes into your gatherings and they're maybe not in the same tax bracket that you are, how do you treat them? Do you pull away from them? Uh, I can't let my children be with those kind of people. See, that's a cultural belief. That's, that's not a Christian belief. Jesus didn't run away from lost people and say, well, I can't spend time with them. On good night, they might rub off on me. That's a cultural belief. What is our culture trying to do right now? Separate, divide. Socioeconomic, that's a problem sometimes. Do we allow political difference to determine how we treat people? Help us all. Do we allow race to determine how we treat people? We attempt to protect our way of life by shunning people living in darkness who desperately need the light that we have. 
If we put a box around ourselves, we hide it under a bushel because we can't possibly allow those people near us, they're going to remain in darkness. So this letter says loudly, Jesus is everything. And do not let cultural beliefs and, and uh, motives and attitudes affect the way that you live. So, while on this earth, you and I are going to battle some things, aren't we, as Christians? We're going to have some battles. The Bible identify three, identifies three areas that we're going to battle constantly. The world, our flesh, and the devil. Those are three things that we will constantly battle. How did the Colossians, how were the Colossians dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil? Well, they saw the devil and demons as equally powerful with God, as almost standing in the way of people connecting with God. So they believed in them, but they saw them in a, in a, in a wrong light. How did the Colossians deal with the flesh? Well, they had this thing called dualism. They thought that all of your appetites in your physical body was bad, but that your spirit was good. So in other words, they could say, you know what? Our appetites, they're just bad and they're going to be bad, but our spirit's good. So ultimately, we're going to be okay because our flesh is going to decay and go away. They completely dismiss their behaviors. And they embraced the world. After all, the culture was making their life a lot easier. So, Colossians, who would try to take the high road to please Jesus, would deny their flesh, the bad part. They would do extreme things like uh, practicing self-denial for certain kinds of foods, extreme abstinence from things, and general sternness about what to eat and drink and do. And they were very harsh with the externals. What Paul is trying to teach them is that your spiritual condition is not about all the things that you put on, all the trappings that you accept. It's about what's going on in your heart between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in his prayer this morning. So let's go on to that. Let's get to the crux of the matter. Paul's prayer, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. His second prayer for the Colossians. Look what he prays for these people. See if you can identify maybe a list. I know it's written in a paragraph form. But see if you can identify bullet points that Paul might have prayed for. All right? Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now this is the word of the Lord, and we are thankful for it this morning. Now let's pray. And here's what we're going to ask God to do with us this morning. <clears throat> we're going to honestly ask the question, if there are any parallels between what the Colossians were dealing with and my heart today? And if there are, what was it that Paul asked God to do in their hearts and what might I ask God to do in my heart? Okay, so let's pray for that this morning. Father, <clears throat> thank you for this time in your presence. Thank you for uh, the ability to worship you together earlier. Lord, it's our prayer that you received our words and our heart. 
as an offering to you of gratitude for your great faithfulness, your great mercy, your great love. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to your holy word, I ask that you would just open my eyes to see my heart, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in me to help me to know the areas that I need to uh, identify and call out as sin and neglect and complacency and begin to see with your eyes, begin to understand from your word and begin to be obedient to your Holy Spirit. And I pray this for myself and these in attendance. In Jesus' name, I ask this. Amen. Okay. So what did Paul ask the Lord for? The Colossians. We saw it there. What was his desire for the people and, and that place at that time? And could we stand in the need of the same things? That's the question. Do we possibly need the same things they did? So let's take a look at this. Look at verse 9 with me. This is great. Do you see how he starts verse 9? He says, for this cause also. What's he talking about? He says, everything I just mentioned, all the things we just talked about, because of the situation that the Colossians are in, because of the culture that they're living in, because of the beliefs that they've adopted, here's what I'm praying for. Based on the information that we know that they're dealing with, and what I hope for them in the future, here's what I'm asking God to do in your life. And so I think anytime you get a prayer list from someone like the Apostle Paul to a, 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 a group of believers, it would be wise for us to say, wow, is this a prayer we could pray for ourselves as a group of believers? So he says, for this cause, for these reasons, because of where you're at, since we heard about your condition... We do not cease to pray for you and to desire. He's asking God because he desires something for the people. Let me ask you, brother, sister, what do you desire for yourself? Really? Do we desire spiritual things, physical things, financial things, emotional things? What do you really desire? Because he says, this is my desire for you. Let's look at his focus in prayer here. He says, number one, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. You get that? What's he asking? God, I'm asking you to help these people to know your will for them. How many of you want to know God's will for your life? Raise your hand. I hope everybody, right? I hope we all want to know God's will for our life. We want to know what he wants from us. And so Paul says, what I'm praying for you is that you will know what God's will is for you. Isn't that good? I hope we all have that desire. God, what do you want for me? And Paul says, I'm praying that you'll know what that is, what God wants for you, the knowledge of the will of God. And then look what he asks for. So that would be number one. The next thing he prays for them is that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in, in all wisdom. For wisdom, and I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, financial wisdom and street smarts and things like that. This is dealing with spiritual wisdom. Maybe discernment would be a better way of saying it. I am praying that you will know God's will for you and how to walk through this life in wisdom. The wisdom of the word of God, the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit's guidance. I'm praying that for you. Don't you want wisdom in this life? As a believer, I don't mean in just making good financial decisions. That's all, you all need all that. I'm asking you spiritually this morning, don't you want wisdom to navigate this world according to what God says in his word and what his Holy Spirit deals in your heart? Don't you desire that? That's a good prayer request. Next, he says, besides the knowledge of the will of God and, and wisdom, he asks for them spiritual understanding. You know, it's wise for us, it's good for us to understand the times that we're in, to understand spiritually what's going on. And if you're not aware of this, I'm going to make you aware of it. There is a constant spiritual battle going on around every believer in the world. Constant. Constant. So if you're a believer in Jesus, there is a spiritual battle. And I know it sounds kind of out there and a little odd and weird, but it's true. There's the forces of evil, 
and God's forces of good who are constantly battling for God's will to be done, always. It's going on around us at all times. So he says, I want you to have spiritual understanding. In other words, these things that happen in our life, many of them are spiritual battles. Now, you stub your toe, that's not necessarily a spiritual battle. Okay? Um, you, you get the wrong order at lunch today, that's not a spiritual battle. Okay? But there are a lot of things in your life that we dismiss that are spiritual battles that are going on. How about a, a relationship that's on the rocks? It's not just because you disagree or you can't get along. There's a spiritual battle going on there. How are you going to respond as God's person? See, this is, these are things that we miss all the time. And Paul says, I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss this. We have to put ourselves in a place to be filled. Didn't he ask for them to be filled with it? I don't want to just dabble in it. I mean, when you go to a, if you went to a restaurant today and they, you ask for a Coke and they bring you a big cup and they fill it with this much Coke, you're going to probably look at it and go, can you fill it? You know, you want to be filled up. You want to be full. He says, I want you to be filled with these things, not just dabble, not just have a little. How do you get filled with something? You've got to be by the source, don't you? If you're going to be filled with something, you have to have a source to fill you. And our source is God himself. Okay? Our source is God himself. If we're going to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, wisdom and spiritual understanding, that doesn't come from anything but God. It takes an attitude. We have to start with an attitude of being open to what is coming from the source. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been in a situation when something started dispensing before you were ready for it? No? Have you ever been in a situation, I love the audience involvement, okay. uh, have you ever been in a situation where you were playing catch and you didn't know it. You know what I mean by that? Somebody threw the ball thinking you were wet, ready for it, and it hit you. The frisbee, the ball, right? A punch, okay? You, they thought you were ready. You weren't ready. You were not in a position to receive. So it hurt. If we are going to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, wisdom and spiritual understanding, we have to put ourselves in a position to receive. We have to be close to the source and expecting from the source. We need to be walking with God. So that's funny because the next thing Paul asks for in his prayers in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. What does walk worthy mean? Another way of saying that would be living in a manner. That you would live in a manner that pleases the Lord. That you would, I'm praying that you, my friend, that you, my brother, that you, my sister, would live in a way that would please God. Obedience to the grace of God. He, he's desiring this. Friend, do you desire to live in a way that pleases God? We would all say yes to that until that is on the opposite side of what would please us, right? Because there are, every day we face situations that we know this would please God, but this would please us, right? And so what do we really want? Do we really want to please God or do we really want to please ourselves or those around us? We've got to start asking those questions. Paul says, I want for you to live in a way that only pleases God. It's a good request, especially for what they're living in. He continues, I want you to live in a way that pleases God, being fruitful in every good work. Fruitful is about producing or reproducing, bearing fruit, a flower that buds, an apple that grows, right? Um, a corn stalk that rises up and there's a, a beautiful ear of corn. It's producing something. He says, I want you to be productive people. What he does not mean is busy and tired and worn out Bless God. I, 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 you know, I've poured out so much that I haven't received anything, but I'm a good tired. There is a good tired, but here's, here's a bad tired. That I don't spend time with God, 
that I'm constantly pouring out and I get to the end of everything and have nothing else to give. It's a bad tire. You and I do not possess what it takes to pour out without receiving in. God does. We do not. And so he says to them, I want you to bear fruit. How do you bear fruit? You're rooted. What kind of fruit should we produce? Does the Bible say anything about fruit? Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Question, are those things evidenced in your life? On a regular basis. We have our days. We have our moments. I mean, pattern. Is there a pattern of the fruit of the Spirit being evidenced in your life? This is a good prayer. God, I pray that I would evidence your life in, that, that your life in me would just produce. It would bud in me. Next, he says, increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 10, the end of verse 10, increasing in the knowledge of God. This is beyond gaining information. It's experiential. It's kind of like when Peter tells husbands to dwell with, in knowledge with their wives. He doesn't mean like, know all the facts about your wife. He means know your wife, know how she works, know her heart, know her mind, those types of things. Do you know God through information or do you know God on a relationship level? He says, I'm praying that you will increase in the knowledge of God that only comes through a relationship. Next, he says in verse 11, strengthened with all might. Strengthened with all might. Where do you get strength as a Christian? There's a lot of ways to get it, but ultimately it comes from the source again. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter three, verses 16 and 17. Check this out. <clears throat> Paul writes to them that he, God, would grant you, Ephesians, Christians, according to the riches of his glory, Look what he says. To be strengthened with might by his spirit. Look at these next four words. In the inner man. Next, next verse. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye, look at these words, being rooted and grounded in love. How does, how do I receive strength? How do I get what it takes to go on <clears throat> and walk worthy as a believer in this life? It is by spending time with God, verse 16 of Ephesians 3. If you could go back to that, Jody. It says, strengthen in the inner man. That does not come by a prayer before your meal at breakfast and a quick, you know, two-second devotional on your app. Being strengthened in your inner man also does not take hours. Did you know that being strengthened in your inner man can take minutes of your day? And this isn't a sales pitch like, hey, easy believism or easy connecting with God. Here's what it means. It means taking time in your day to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, to put him in front of you, not as an afterthought, to center yourself in Christ. To turn all of your cares and your stresses over to him. To leave it in his hands. To acknowledge him as first and foremost. As preeminent. That's how you and I are going to get strength to live this life. You can't run on empty. The good news is it doesn't take hours and hours and hours to get filled up. It takes a time with God, recognizing who he is and what he deserves, what place he deserves in your life. Centering yourself in Christ. This is being strengthened in the inner man. Next. We read here. According to his glorious power, we get strength by his power. 
<clears throat> Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. You see three evidences, three fruit of the Spirit there. He says, What this will produce in you, strength in the inner man, what it will produce in you is those three things. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father. For what purpose? Why do we give thanks to God? Was it because everything went our way today? No, we give thanks to the Father because He's made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. What has God done? He has given us a share in his son's inheritance as saints. If you're born again, you are a saint. And you get a share in Jesus' inheritance. That's worth thanking God for. Do you know what we deserve? We deserve hell. We come into this world on our own merit, deserving only an eternity in hell by what we've done. But because of what Jesus has done, and if you place your faith in Jesus and what he has done, you then receive part of the Lord Jesus' inheritance. That's worth giving thanks for. How do you get it? How do you get part of the inheritance? Because you're such an awesome person? Look what Paul says. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, you could even say transported us, into the kingdom of his dear son. It's a transaction that happens. You get moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, just like this. How? Verse 14. Through his blood. Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You had your sins forgiven. You see that? Even the forgiveness of sin. You move from one state, hell-bound, deep in sin, living on your own merit, on your way to an eternity in hell. When you place your faith in Jesus, immediately you are moved over into the kingdom of light. Your sins are forgiven, and it all happened, not because you're awesome, but because Jesus shed his blood. He is awesome. He did everything God required, shed his blood to buy redemption for anybody who would believe in him. And those who believe go from darkness kingdom to the kingdom of light. That is worth giving thanks for. What a prayer. What a prayer. What if we prayed these things for ourselves and each other each day? I would believe we'd be better off for it. When I look at my prayer list compared to this one, I'm ashamed to be honest with you. I pray for a lot of superficial things. I pray for a lot of selfish things. And, and don't get me wrong, the Bible says bring your cares in him. We're supposed to pray and ask for what we want. But do we ever get there, you know? Do we ever get there? So, question, and this is where we'll close. Have you ever had your sins forgiven by Jesus? How does that happen? By placing your faith in Jesus Christ and him only and what he did on the cross for your sins. He took your punishment from God for you. And when you place your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross, your sins are forgiven. You move from one kingdom to another immediately. Heaven is your home. You're living with the Holy Spirit with you constantly and he will guide you. It all takes place when your faith is in Jesus. Have you done that? Let's stand together. Gary, if you'd come and just play a, a song for us. Here's our time to respond now, okay? We're not finished yet. Because now it's our turn. We've received, we've heard what God had for us today, and now we have to respond to that. What has he said to you, brother or sister, individually? Individually. What in this did he point to you and say, this is specifically what I'm telling you today? Maybe there was several things, maybe there was one. What did he point out to you today? Do you need to have your sins forgiven? Do you need to trust Jesus and know that heaven is your home? If that's your case this morning, you can right where you are. You can just bow your head and quietly, silently, even in your heart, ask the Lord Jesus to 
to save your soul. Tell him you believe in him. Do you? And if you do, tell him you do. If you believe that Jesus did take your penalty on the cross, that he died, was buried, and rose again, and shed his blood to forgive, if you believe that, tell him. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I am a sinner. You are perfect. You died for me. You took my sin, my punishment on yourself. I believe this. I believe that you even rose from the dead after you died. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to save my soul. I'm telling you, according to what the Bible says. In fact, here's what the Bible says. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a definite term. If you call on Jesus this morning, you 100% shall, will definitely be saved.